Welcome, I'm Ben Boyce, prison educator, author, and host of this podcast, The Dr. Junkie Show. I've been asked a lot what it's like to be in a class where I'm teaching. And of course, I always answer, it's awesome, you'd love it. But that just doesn't seem to do justice to the experience of sitting in a classroom as I blab 100 miles an hour about drugs, culture, and the brain. So today I wanted to share a lecture I gave as a guest in a class a few weeks ago. I was asked to come talk about drugs in my book, and it turned into a pretty productive conversation. I didn't get permission from the students who were there to share their voices, so I've cut out anything that isn't me, although I've made sure you can follow along any time a line is cut. This is a fast and furious, information-heavy episode. I cover tolerance, sensitization, evolution, dopamine, the thrill of the hunt and the thrill of the feast, liking versus wanting, pruning during adolescence, the price of cocaine production versus the price on the streets, the design of the war on drugs and how it ensures we'll always have new users and dealers to replace those that we arrest, and I even managed to squeeze in a few questions from students near the end. Can everybody see my screen? One with all the drugs on it? Right. I'm going to try to sort of blow through my spiel of things that I've found over the years are the most important of the things we're sort of misinformed about drugs or that more importantly, even if we know, somebody asks us and we're often like, I, I just know that they're not as bad as people say, but I can't explain. So I want to give us some quick, ready to go facts to use to talk to people about drugs. And as we talk through this, think about questions you've had about drugs forever. If we don't get them answered, I'll make some space today to have some question and answer time. A little bit about me. I spent time in prison. I'm an addicted person. I spent six, seven years injecting, mainline injecting cocaine and heroin largely were my two drugs of choice. Used fentanyl a lot, but this was before it's what we think of today. Nowadays, it's like made on the streets and laced into heroin. And nowadays, we're getting a taste for it, actually. There's a lot of addicted people that are not overdosing, as we'll talk about, because it's being cut into heroin, but because they're buying fentanyl. It's cheaper, it's easier to get a hold of, and you can carry around a small dose and get through your day. So to get us really thinking, how many of us either have someone close to you or have struggled with addiction yourself? Just to give us an idea of how many of us, okay. My guess is if we dug deep enough and said, well, how about a friend of a friend? It wouldn't take long before every hand in the class went up. We've had this last five-year period where suddenly this is all over the news again. 100,000 people is this big number that's been flashed up that died from overdose this year. It's hard to really appreciate that if you haven't been studying drugs for a long time, but our normal numbers have hovered between 17,000 and 30,000 deaths, overdose deaths. And in the last five years, we are at 100,000 overdose deaths. A big part of that is fentanyl, but a big part of that is all of the stuff that as college students, you've been now charged with digging through and trying to figure out why everyone seems to hate each other right now and why name calling and lying from the highest office in the land seems to get a little more popular every year and why people are raiding the capital we're in a pretty weird time to be alive that pain that anxiety that cultural tension drugs work really well to feed it so what would happen if we legalized all drugs put this up there as sort of our thinker question what have we always been told would happen if we legalize all drugs there we go yeah more people would use them Chaos, right? We've been told our whole lives that things would just explode. Oh man, we would have a whole world addicted. Drugs used to be legal in the United States. You used to be able to pull out your Sears catalog and for a buck, oh, I think the exact number was like $1.37. It was less than $2. You could order, delivered to your door, two vials of heroin in a hypodermic syringe that you could reload and use with the heroin. You could order it as much as you needed. No big deal. It turns out that it was not what we would think. We had a huge proportion of people, as you read in the book, who were wealthy before. Actually, I think this is in chapter two. Only 6% of people who classified themselves as actively addicted were below the poverty line when drugs were legal, cheap, and easy to get. What's up with that? We had very different social conceptions of what drug users looked like back then. By the time we're done today, we can dig into a little bit of why that might be. Supply and demand. We're going to talk about why drugs will never go away if we keep fighting this war the way we've been fighting it. Vocabulary. Y'all are communication people, right? You realize words have power. Dopamine. What's the first part of that? That dope. That's why that word's so hot, right? We totally misunderstand dopamine because of that dope on the beginning to be like, it's when people feel good and you bad drug users are taking more than your fair share. 
That misunderstanding of dopamine has fueled a big part of our stigmatized culture. A few terms associated, many of you might be familiar if you drink coffee or if any of you drink alcohol or, geez, even soda, tolerance and sensitization. The one beer that when you were 18 years old or for some of us 14 that got you drunk, now you're like, well, I can still get there, but it takes two or three. Your body's learned to recognize these things. Why do we detox? Laws and where they came from. As I said, I don't think we'll get through all this. So trust me, if we get towards the end and I'm yakking on, I'll cut it short. So here's what I want to start us with a flash catch up of everything most of you all probably already know about drugs because we've learned these things through the years. So, Sarah, what's going on here? Sarah? Sarah? She won't answer you. Or she can't. Why not? This is the way it's been since she started smoking pot. She's all lazy and boring and you know we used to have so much fun together this is what happens to your brain after snorting heroin and this is what your body goes through wait it's not over yet this is what your family goes through your friends who taught you how to do this stuff you all right i learned it by watching you Parents who use drugs have children who use drugs. It takes your life away from you. I threw away 14 years of my life. Sad. I used to be a stupid rock and roll cliche. This is what we've all learned most of our lives. Now, uh, they were fuzzy. Some of these go back to like the 1980s when I was a kid. You feel like you're learning a lot from these PSAs and they don't teach you anything. And the D.A.R.E. officers that came and visited as many of us in school, we really felt like, oh, it's that day when we're going to learn. And we probably remember if we were in a program like that, they pull out a big piece of cardboard that has drugs like inside it labeled. And as you walk away, you usually are scratching your head like, well, now I know which drug I would do, but I didn't learn much else. We don't learn about why the war exists, what other options we have. Most of us, by the time we're out of high school, know that most of the stuff we learn from school, from PSAs, from our parents was largely just rubbish, fear-based to get us to not use drugs. So we know we can't trust them. There's more there than what we were told, but we also know that like there's a lot to be afraid of. They destroy lives and that's the end. And there's some truth to both of these things. But the more I've dug into drugs and in my, my professional career studying and academically, the more I've realized the majority of the harm comes from the culture we've built around them. This used to be conjecture until 25 years ago when Portugal had a massive heroin problem. A full 1% of the population of Portugal was addicted to heroin and 10% were using heroin regularly. They were in a bad spot and politicians threw up their hands and were like, we're locking everybody up. It's not working. Our parks are full of needles. Nobody is working because they won't hire people that are using drugs. Let's decriminalize drugs. And they rewrote their laws to allow people to possess small quantities. There's a big problem. You still can't sell drugs in Portugal, so they still arrest tons of people if you've got more than the minimum amount. But voila, they have 75% less heroin and cocaine use across the board since drugs are decriminalized. Since the 25 years, other countries have done the same thing. And now you can get prescriptions for heroin up north of us in Canada and across Europe. In fact, England ran heroin trials for a while in the 19, I want to say the 80s. I didn't plan to talk about this, but they actually had people that they would give heroin to daily, come in and get it from, from a doctor and we'll test you and see where your life ends up. And they saw across the board, people get jobs, people get back to normal. That doesn't even make sense to most of us. Like I know in my heart of hearts that if they legalize cocaine, everyone's going to be addicted to cocaine. We've really been that misinformed in our war on drugs. It turns out when these things aren't romanticized, and people get them not from dealers who, when you're buying weed, might say, hey, I got some, some Molly. You want to buy some Molly too? Ooh, and I got some Coke. I'll give you a great deal on all three. Anybody's doctor ever done that? And like, I know you're here for an antidepressant. Before you go, you want some Vicodin? Want some Xanax? No, of course not. Your doctors do the opposite. All right, so another question for the group. What is addiction in our public vernacular? What, what does addiction mean in a nutshell? And this is what I think we'll find. We're better at talking about the fruit of addiction, but it's like the Supreme Court famously said about pornography when they were like, well, we got to define what pornography is. Anybody know this quote? I know it when I see it. When there's things that we have a hard time identifying and yet we know very well what they are, maybe there's a red light. Anybody want to try to add to that? How do we know if someone's addicted? What's the, in our culture, what's the big thing we usually just sum it up with? 
How do you know someone's addicted if you're hanging out with them? They use the drug every day. They're ornery if they don't use it. Ooh, we got addiction. What's that called? That's not addiction. When somebody needs a drug to be at their best. Dependency, yes. But I see many of you, like me, drinking coffee. We probably won't have time to get to this, but Coca-Cola's long history of most of us know it had cocaine in it. It actually didn't have cocaine in it. It was cocaine. There was no soda in it. It was cocaine wine when it originally came out. They had to get rid of the cocaine, then they had to get rid of the wine. Actually, reverse order, believe it or not. And then they added this new fandangle drug that we all now drink with the coffee beans, caffeine. And the Supreme Court said hell to the no. And the case went all the way through to where most of us wouldn't be allowed to drink this today if the government had had their way when the war on drugs began. History that's been lost. But when we think about addiction, why aren't we addicted to coffee? Where do you go if you got a caffeine headache? Because you didn't get your coffee this morning. Any okay. freaking where within, <laughs> right, you just bring your little electronic magic device out and say, caffeine. Starbucks, the basement of the Briscoe Center, the McDonald's up the street, every restaurant ever. We've incorporated the drug into our infrastructure, and I don't know the last time I remember hearing a story of somebody taking a sip of their coffee, and it was a thousand times stronger than it was supposed to be, and they overdosed on caffeine in one sip. just doesn't happen. If there was such a thing as coffee, like fentanyl is to heroin, it's, it's upwards of a hundred times stronger. It would be the equivalent of ordering a wine and taking one sip and being like, ooh, that's good, and taking another sip. And if it's a hundred times stronger, just like fentanyl is to heroin, of course you overdose. What the people in the restaurant are going to see is, is somebody that's got a real bad addiction. You just overdosed in front of all of us. Supply has a big part to do with this. So we've gotten a little bit closer. Dependencies drive addiction. If you read, I think that was in chapter two of the book. But they're not synonymous with addiction and cocaine and methamphetamine and MDMA and psychedelics like LSD and magic mushrooms, now decriminalized in Colorado. Go do your shrooms. They don't cause traditional physical dependency. You can take them every day and you'll never. This is a, like comes with a caveat because cocaine and methamphetamine actually cause like really harsh short term dependency. One of the biggest effects of both drugs is wanting to do more of the drug. But the next morning when you've come down off the high, you are not going to be physically ill and not able to go to work, unlike with, say, Xanax or alcohol or, or heroin or codeine, a lot of other drugs. But we still wouldn't say those drugs aren't addictive. Dependency doesn't make us addicted. Many of us take antidepressants and we would detox if we stopped taking them. We don't think we're addicted to those either. Some drugs don't make us dependent. That's about as close as we'll get. If you want to cite somebody, the DSM-5 in our field, always a great source to go to. If somebody says, that's not what addiction is. You can say, well, it's what the DSM says addiction is. It requires negative consequences. The National Institute on Drug Abuse, characterized by drug craving, seeking, and use that persist even in the face of devastating life consequences. Maya Selovitz is one of my favorite addiction authors, a coping style that becomes maladaptive when the behavior persists despite ongoing negative consequences. We're turning the corner into my area of social stigma and how we talk about drug use. The first two say drug use is bad, but addiction is when like it really gets bad. Number three and mine, number four, explain that drug use is just something humans have always done and we always will. Most of us are using drugs right now to some fashion. The fact that sometimes they get out of control is something we should talk about and help people through when it happens, but the drug use itself is not that bizarre. Almost everybody uses some sort of drug or some sort of behavior in their life, a, a religious experience you regularly have, a trip to Vegas that you go on once a year or once a month if you're me, things like that. So until there's negative life consequences, this is a pretty telling statistic and I want to not just rush past it because usually students write it down and then they throw it at their parents unreflectively because their parents hopefully say what the obvious answer to this is. 80% of the people that try all drugs, methamphetamine, injecting heroin, smoking crack for the weekend just to see what it's like, never struggle with addiction throughout their entire life. Not right now, I'm talking 20 years from now, still have never once struggled with addiction. That's the vast majority. Remember the very important follow-up question, which is if I told you you could drive to Vegas and it's 12 hours across the desert through Utah, so hide your weed, or you can get on an airplane and it's one hour and you're, you're on the strip, you'd be like, well, the airplane, what if I said four out of five of them make it there? <laughs> the other one, I mean, the other one usually crash. So you got like a four and five shot, 80% of never struggling with a crash. This is not an argument to start using drugs. It's an argument to be responsible. That statistic's pretty vital because those PSAs we just watched, they taught us all. If you use cocaine, 
you will become addicted. If you use heroin, you will become addicted. That's what our system of current drug laws, current drug policy has been built on. It's been built on to just say no, just tell people it's bad, don't talk about the good. And that's why we're all living through a really weird cultural update where our parents and grandparents have to be scratching their head that there's ketamine clinics in Colorado and there's psilocybin is legit here. Like you can just go use it and then talk about it. I had a podcast where I debriefed my daughter about a year and a half ago after her first psilocybin trip. That is something that seems bizarre to people, but only because we spent so long growing up thinking that drugs are evil. There's a quote that I think only shows up in chapter one, but I lean on it deep through the rest of the book that all drug users in a culture of prohibition are drug dealers. Because right now, as this cultural update I mentioned is happening, the courts are in the, the police departments and to some degree us, the public, are starting to say, oh, someone was arrested for drugs. Well, were they a dealer or a user? And if they're a dealer, lock those mother effers up. And if they're a user, we're like, oh, well, we've got to give these people treatment. The fact is that in a culture of prohibition, unless you are incredibly rich, you have to sell drugs for a number of reasons. The biggest being that if you're going to the drug man's house to get a small amount, it's leaps and bounds cheaper the more you get. So if you're buying a gram of cocaine, 70 to 80 bucks, depending on maybe a little bit less if it's junk. If you're buying an eight ball, three and a half grams of cocaine, it's like 150 bucks. Talk about some hella math. You just like scored three times almost what you were going to get. If you're an addicted person, that's pretty important because you're going to be detoxing without it. So the best thing to do is to get your friends together, get everybody's money. I'll go to the dope house. And the added benefit is there's only one person risking their freedom walking home. Danger, you get pulled over, you're a drug dealer because these laws are based almost exclusively on how much dope is in your pocket. So in Portugal, anything more than a gram or two, you're automatically a dealer. So maybe we can just arrest our way out of this. This is where we've been moving in the last couple of years. We can sue the pharmaceutical companies. We can act like we don't know. Prescriptions for opioids have been cut in half in the last 10 years in this country. And that's been a big part of why the overdose race has gone through the roof. We can act like we don't understand that when doctors cut patients off, they don't just stop using and instead they go to the street. So we need drug dealers. If we could just get rid of the dealers, no big deal. A gram of heroin or cocaine, heroin's about 14 cents more, cost a dollar a gram to make in the jungles of South America, a dollar a gram. You can sell that same gram for 70 bucks on the streets of Denver, except it's only 15 to 45% cocaine. It's been mixed with all sorts of stuff. So we can do some quick math and realize, well, then it's not $70 a gram. It's like $400 a gram because that one gram is now sold five different times, all cut down into crap cocaine. Every step of the way from South America, where you can actually produce it in the jungle, go buy two and a half acres of leaves from a local cocalera, a farmer, and just make your own kilo of cocaine and sell it for 12 grand up the street. And then that person can put it on a boat or walk it up to Mexico and sell it for 16 grand. That person can walk it across the Texas border and sell it for 20. And as it weasels its way north, the price goes through the roof. And the only people that ever have a chance to get rich are the original manufacturer and the person who's at the end selling a ton. Because most of this stuff winds up in the hands of somebody who has a phone bill due or their rent's due next week. And they're in an apartment wondering, somebody's going to sell this dude some dope. And if I go get it from this apartment and take it to this apartment, I can make 30 bucks and like buy my kids some food today. If that system always exists, and it will in the United States, how can we ever think that people won't make the logical choice and go run the drugs to somebody who's going to buy them anyway? And now we've got another drug dealer to lock up and another family who's on social assistance. We can get rid of all legal drug dealers overnight by putting it in doctor's offices and slashing the price through the floor. And I'm sorry for all those drug dealers on the street who now have junk they can't sell, but that's what should happen. The second you can buy it for five bucks a gram, nobody's going to buy that crap from Jerry up the block for a hundred bucks a gram. So I mentioned this earlier. I want to just point out some of the terms when I said our vocabulary is so bad. We think of addiction. <clears throat> we often don't really know what we mean. Dependency, negatively impacted. Maybe it means your whole life falls apart and your teeth fall out, right? very ambiguous terms unless you've struggled with it yourself. Overdose, as someone who deals with drugs a lot and talks to people about drugs a lot, 
we don't know what overdose means. Certainly it means, well, we found you on the street and we had to use Narcan to save your life. Yes, you've overdosed. But it also means I drank too much coffee and I'm jittery today. And then I had, I was up for like an extra hour before I could go to sleep. It also means I took an extra Vicodin and I couldn't take a dump the next day and I was uncomfortable. We don't really have a vocabulary that would really be vital to sort of break these issues apart and have real conversations. Tough love. We'll get to that today. We don't even know what it means, but it's our only answer in the U.S. Recovery. People like me that smoke weed every day, that use drugs and have a great life, are publishing books and teaching in multiple colleges inside Denver and have a podcast. I teach in a prison as well, so I have like a lot of hats I wear. I teach two classes in Colorado prisons to incarcerated people working in the communication program up at CU Denver, just north of y'all. Recovery is not supposed to apply to us. So over and over when I tell people, well, I'm in recovery. I mean, I was living on the street slamming dope 20 times a day and wound up in prison for stealing stereos out of cars. I think I'm in recovery. I think I can rest assured that I feel safe using that term. It doesn't fit our model. We tend in the United States only base recovery on sober. And these three terms that we're already sort of bumping into, I don't think we should legalize drugs. I think that what we're going to do is, is going to look more like with alcohol. Most people wouldn't say alcohol is, is illegal in the United States, and, but we wouldn't say decriminalize, but that's the model that we're looking for. I don't want kids to be able to use drugs. And right now, my dealer doesn't lose jack shit if they sell to a 13-year-old. There's no license for them to lose. It's not possible. Whereas liquor store dealers have a very good reason to check IDs. And I think what we would really move towards is a model where you know, you can buy codeine or something at the store, but if you want heroin, you just go see the doc. And guess what? Now, instead of a drug dealer saying, take some cocaine too, the doc says, what's up? Why are you here? And the doc can explain that heroin you want to use. We'll talk about it, but do you know that these other drugs are the same drug and that they're a little bit safer to take? Vicodin, codeine, morphine, a lot of different drugs that we, a lot of people don't realize opioids are opioids. So let's, let's talk about dopamine. I mentioned this early into the discussion for those that weren't here yet. Dopamine is perhaps the most misunderstood neurotransmitter we have. There's some things that are worth noting here. So if you see which direction the arrows are going, they're coming from the brain stem, a deep, they're actually coming from just above the brain stem, a deep part of the brain that evolved very early in our history as a species, as humans. And that's important because then this pathway goes up to the prefrontal cortex, a part of our brain that evolved very late in our development as a species in that it's related to prediction. Prefrontal cortex doesn't really come online for most people till we're between 23 and 26 years old, which says a lot about why most of us feel like we just think totally different than we used to. But it's the part of your brain that puts together past experience and lets you make legitimate predictions without blowing your life up over some stupid mistake every single day. And you can do it quick. The fact that that's where that pathway runs from says a lot about what's going on and why drugs that fire the dopamine system are so valuable. I always want to give people like an example because dopamine feels good, but not in the way that we typically think. And dopamine can feel bad. You actually get the same quantity of dopamine released into your neural pathways when you lose a massive bet than when you win a massive bet. What? We, and we've known this for a long time. There's something not quite right with what we think. Another big thing, there's only 100,000 neurons in our brain that specialize in dopamine. That's it. The rest of our brain, 86 billion neurons, don't even know what dopamine is. If you dumped them in, they'd be like, what is this? And they'd push it out of there because of how neurons work. They specialize in one neurotransmitter, most of them. So if dopamine isn't just straight up pleasure, what the heck is it? I like to break this into two different categories, wanting and liking. And we would, then you weren't like... We have to go talk about whatever boring thing is on week six that's coming up that you're dreading and you're going to skip the class. You might even like what you learned that day, but when you log in or you go to work and punch the clock or you get up and you've got to go do that thing, that's liking something. I like a roof over my head, so I punch a clock. But when I want to do something, we all know something very different is going on when we pick that book up and we're excited than when we're like, I got to read my assignments this week. That wanting is dopamine. So dopamine's more akin to that feeling of you're getting ready to do it. And when dopamine really starts to show up is when we start to learn things. When you're, say, learning a new skill and instead of having to read the math problem all the way to the end and then go, oh, okay, I get it. You start to pick it up and figure out the answer before you read it. Boop, dopamine. It's about prediction and predictability. So when I said that it can actually be annoying, I want to give you an example of that. We're going to all feel dopamine becoming annoying. The 
first one. Most of you probably heard that jingle. It's like probably the first jingle humans came up with. The second one, when your brain was playing along and then that last note was elongated, that's dopamine overstaying its welcome. And anytime you've been in a situation where you're like, I want to do this thing and now uh, waiting in line for a, a water slide or a roller coaster or something, you're like, oh, I just want to get up here. That's dopamine, that want fueled, saying, we're here, we're supposed to be doing this. It's real time firing, trying to keep up with the song so that the next time that song shows up, I'm a little bit quicker to recognize it. So here's the big million dollar question. Why? What's up with that? With the little bit we've already talked about, the brainstem, the early part of our evolutionary history, wiring up a reward pathway that goes to the prefrontal cortex that seems very intricately involved in our success at prediction. What's up with that? Any guesses? Any bio majors in here? Yeah, we needed it for survival to tell us that thing you went into, mark it as dangerous. Or that berry patch you walked into where you found those berries, mark those memories. You did it. You found the thing. So that in the future, those memories, those pathways, those events stand out. Because if you look back a year and you're like, oh, I did go find some berries a year ago. Let me start digging through every single day. No, it wasn't that one. Our brains are very good at throwing information away. So dopamine is a way of marking memories is important. All right, so I want to back out of that a little bit and try to, to draw a distinction between thrill of the hunt and thrill of the feast. These are two states of mind that you can almost put yourself in. I've never hunted in my life. I even grew up in the country and didn't hunt. But thinking about being on a horse and running through the woods and cutting left and cutting right and ducking under the tree and just being in the zone. So I ride uh, ATVs. So where I think about this a lot is ATVs. Anyway, I get in the zone when I'm riding four wheelers. Some people do it when they're reading something good or when they're teaching or when they're giving a presentation or when you take certain drugs and things just sort of align because all drugs do is tinker with processes that are already underway in the body. They speed them up or they slow them down. The end. Every drug. So dopamine is not pleasure, but it's very related to this thrill of the hunt. Before I said wanting and liking, and most of us were like, yeah, I can see how those are two very different types of pleasure. Drugs mimic these things. So cocaine tends to mimic this thrill of the hunt. And then another sort of pleasure that we could all sort of put in our own mindset is this thrill of the feast. It's when you get the paperback that you hunted, you worked so hard on, and you were scrawling, and that word popped up at the right minute. And you were like, oh my God, that sentence is so good. And your citation was on point, and you turn it in. You're thrilled when you turn it in. You are high, thrill of the hunt. When you get it back and it's got an A on it, you're like, ah, thrill of the feast, satiation not dopamine. Weird, right? Because that's where most of us think if we measured our dopamine levels, they would be through the roof. They're actually relatively low in the satiated state because we're supposed to, as humans, go through these natural processes of escalation, satiation, hunt, reward, go back and enjoy your thing. Work hard on that paper, get the A and get on with your life, right? It's about moving on in life, getting a little better. These are sort of generalizations. All drugs don't really fall into these categories, but most actually do. So you can think of thrill of the feast, uh, anybody that takes benzodiazepines, I'm, I take Valium. A lot of people take Xanax, it's a benzodiazepine. Alcohol actually works very much the same way with some caveats. It provides this mimicking of the thrill of the feast. It slows down, it literally slows down our neuron firing by opening some calcium channels that lower the voltage inside our neurons so that normally when you'd be like, ah, it takes a little more spider falling from the ceiling to really make those circuits the, uh, to make them fire. Those are mimics of thrill of the feast, whereas the excitement, the cocaine, the ah, I'm skydiving today, those are a mimicking of this thrill of the hunt. So I love that we got right to evolution early on when I was like, what's the value of this? It's survival. We're right back to our, our species history of living not in cities and dwellings, but of all the way back to when we were just barely recognizable as a species. And even earlier, all the things we brought with us that made us able to survive to that point are played out in our daily lives. We just do it differently. We're not necessarily always hunting and then eating raw meat off the ground. All right, let's talk about tolerance, how we learn to be in the world. So think about when you were a kid your guardians, the people you lived with, and how they could do no wrong. And to some degree, they were just fun to be around. In fact, things that later in life, as we'll talk about in a minute, 
just annoyed the crap out of you. You look back to when you're like two, three, four, five, six, seven. I wasn't annoyed at all. I don't know what, what's going on there. As humans, among our other survival mechanisms, we've established the ability to tolerate things and to become sensitized to other things. As you might guess, things that we become tolerant to are anything that our body and brain reads or recognizes as safe, enjoyable, beneficial to us. And the reason that we become tolerant is probably pretty obvious. We want to make sure that if we recognize in the case of parents, because this isn't always drugs, these processes play out every day in our lives, usually not with drugs. Drugs do it too. But with parents, whatever annoying crap, whatever that food they eat, the way they mix like seasoned salt on their popcorn, million, the, the music that they like, and you're like, oh my God, none of that is oh my god when you're a kid you tolerate it all so much that you don't even notice you can take so much of these people and never overdose because your body reads them as safe so safe actually that you need them in the case of parents whereas with sensitization as we'll see the opposite happens so you can think about how tolerance happens not just with your parents but peekaboo when you are like six months old the world is so fabulous everything just makes you like whoa dude by the time you're four, you're like, fuck off with the peekaboo. Like, there is nothing in that anymore that excites me. This is the, the fruit of tolerance. Unfortunately, as every drug dealer or drug user, longtime addicted person would say, sensitization and tolerance suck. If somebody could just turn them off. Addiction would be gone the next day because the original dose would always do what the small dose does. But tolerance, unfortunately, means that to be able to accept more of them it takes way more to get the benefit that you once got that's like peekaboo ah it's mommy it's mommy right it's mommy it's mommy and eventually we get to the point where sometimes those things don't fire those good circuits at all and we're back to where we started with addiction when things change in our brain and that drug that used to do the fabulous spectacular thing stops doing it and then we take so much that it's causing negative consequences but we keep taking it anyway because it's the only show in town we're at that spot where tolerance has changed the game on us without us being able to keep up with it. There, peekaboo. Cartoons. Hilly Roads. I have this really cool story of when I realized I was an addicted person. I was seven or eight years old and in a car with my whole family, three sisters, mom and dad driving, and my dad pulled the e-brake going down a dirt road. Anybody else got know somebody that's done this? Been in a car when somebody yanks the e-brake? The back tires lock up. Now he knew this, so the car just did a 180 and this dude just kept going. It was like spectacular. And in that moment, I was in love. And I looked over at my mom and sisters and they were like, what are you doing? I was like, well, this is weird. There's things that strike different people different ways. So my mom and sisters, they read that, they uh, recognized that experience as terrifying, exciting, unsafe, danger. And because of that, their brains did the opposite of mine. They became sensitized, which sucks because for the rest of my life, when they ride with me and I kind of am driving like a jackass, it doesn't take much at all. Two over the speed limit and they're clutching the door handle. Whereas I became tolerant the older I got to this thing that I just, I thrive off it. I'm an addicted person. I love just ripping it around a corner and tearing up a chunk of your grass. All right. So sensitization, the flip side, anytime your brain reads something exciting, or dangerous. Now, why would exciting count as dangerous in our brains? It's worth thinking about because this is where we really get into some trouble as addicted people. A lot of times, the things we become sensitized to, like uh, if you've ever seen somebody bug eyed from cocaine or methamphetamine, that's typically the result of sensitization. The first few times we use these drugs, those same things happen, but we just don't notice them and people around us don't see them. The longer we use, the part of the drug that we read is dangerous, your heart rate is up and your body's like, hey, something that got in us just raised our heart rate through the roof. You lose some uh, associations and there's some escalation in neurons firing in weird ways that your body reads as something weird's going on here. And if we're not careful, this could be really dangerous. So let's make sure the next time this thing, whatever it is, shows up, we fire a little bit earlier to let everybody inside our bodies know danger, danger, danger. Something is here that could really hurt us if we're not careful. And unfortunately, this means the negative parts of drugs affect us earlier and earlier and worse and worse with less quantities the longer we use, whereas the positive benefits of drugs affect us less and less. It sucks. The biggest place people see sensitization show up as humans, if you've been through anything you experienced as a trauma, those things show back up later in your life in the most unexpected freaking ways. And the therapist can say to us, I've been to prison and many other traumas. 
They can say to us till they're blue in the face, you have to work through that. There's no danger there, Ben. It showed up and that thing that happened to me 20 years ago was right back there and I had to clock out and go home. I could not do it. What is going on? We're sensitized. We experienced something that was so scary, terrifying, dangerous, exciting, whatever to us that our brains marked it in such a way that sometimes we see it when it, before it's even there. Sensitization goes before use. It shows up in ways and tolerance for that matter. The smell of the drug. If you're uh, rolling a joint and you're a big weed smoker, the process of twisting your fingers a certain way, your brain knows what's going on. It immediately starts the counterbalance measures before the drugs even get into your system. That's how clever our brains are. It doesn't do us much good to wait till after the drugs get in. We've got to make sure that if this cocaine's coming and it's dangerous, push the, the counter effects. When I get to Vegas, like now I recognize it earlier every time. It's funny. I'd recognize it in the airport now. Sensitization overtakes all the things that used to be totally tolerant. Evolutionary history is our, our underlying theme today. Why is it that as we get older, those things about our parents that didn't bug us are suddenly horrific and embarrassing and we're so sensitive to them? What's up with that? Considering sensitization and tolerance are about survival. It always is weird to talk in evolutionary language, but the benefit, as weird as that seems, of a group of kids thousands of years ago that would have at a certain age just become like annoyed as hell at their parents and said, oh, we don't want to be around you. I'm going to find a partner to mate with. Benefit in the sense of how many kids can you reproduce in a lifetime. It's a benefit if at 15, before your prefrontal cortex is wired up, you're out having sex with all sorts of people. That is going to make a lot more babies net than not. So that is why, and then those kids are born and they have many of the same characteristics as their parents, including this annoyance. Now there's something else going on through our teenage years called pruning. Does anybody know what pruning is? Now that I put it on the screen. It's kind of a lot of what we talked about with growing up. The Legos freaking suck, right? And it's so weird. If you've ever pulled toys out that you used to play with, even five, ten years ago and been like, the fuck is this doing here? Like, I used to like this. This is, I don't know. Who was that person? It's not that you've changed that much. Where I really see this is if you've ever walked down the, the usually the cereal aisle in the United States, because we put all our sugar there, and you see something and you're like, cookie crisp, I love that as a kid. And you get home and you pour a bowl and you're like, what the hell happened to the cookie crisp or the fruity pebbles or whatever your thing is? These things might have changed, but it's probably you. The pathways in your brain that are wired up to say, <laughs> go away. This tells us a lot as a parent, if you're going to have kids or you know a parent that has kids, of what you should be doing to prepare your kids for a world where drugs are now and will always be a thing. When they're going through something that feels like their life is ending, all of the stuff that used to bring them pleasure doesn't freaking work anymore. Add to that all these social concerns that are simultaneously showing up. So if the Legos still do bring you pleasure, you better not play with them, man. Somebody's going to see you and there's these weird social anxieties that are there, so I don't want anybody to know I play with Legos. So even though that one still brings me joy, I can't do that either. And then someone hands you a set of keys to a car. And we wonder, why do 16-year-olds have such massively high accident rates for doing dumb shit? Maybe it's that we haven't had the conversation about pruning. So it's totally natural for kids to want to do incredible things as that movement into an adult, just bizarre things. I think I wrecked half a dozen cars by the time I was 18. Luckily, didn't kill anybody. But this is why we're losing those connections and then at the same time trying to figure out who the heck we are. Parents, uh, I always add this to sort of cap the, this isn't a pro-drug. You know, Anybody that walks away from my lecture like, no, I really want to use drugs, probably wasn't listening. Usually you come in thinking you're going to learn all sorts of cool stuff and want to go get high. And then when you leave, you're like, crap, <laughs> that's not quite what I thought. If as a kid, you can get to 21 years old without having established any substance abuse disorder, any addictions prior to that that you've struggled with, you are 90% less likely to ever in your life struggle. That means we could almost tell our kids that if you can make it till 21 before you start smoking weed all the time or before you have any sort of start drinking regularly, 21, you can basically not worry anywhere near as much because you've had a wicked, a wicked run for the worst shit that will ever happen to you in your life. Your brain snipped off half of the fun things that identified you as a person and said, you don't get to enjoy that anymore. And you got through it without using the, the light switch of, you know, opium or whatever. You know how to handle those things. You pick up tricks and tools through those years that then you deploy later in life. 
right, I don't want to belabor it, but I do want to just touch on some quick drugs and then cool, we're going to be less than an hour. That was my goal. And then make sure we have plenty of time for any questions. So what we've been talking about is the opponent process. I love to think of our bodies as homeostasis machines. And there's good reason for this. That is uh, the underlying theme for today, to stay alive. So someone stabs you, right? And everything was fine. You were just kind of feeling good about life, not high, not low. I have a knife in me. Your body right now needs to be able to, one, recognize that you are desperately wounded. But then it needs to be able to turn that off. Because if you feel that pain and you react like you should, if there's a knife hanging out of your gut, well, you're just going to stay there and die. You need to ignore Know it's there, ignore it, and have some sort of reaction in your body that lets you run the hell away. If you're jacked up on cocaine all the time, well, that reaction's always going on, and it's not going to be as effective when you dump a bunch of adrenaline into blood that's already packed with adrenaline. So this is why our bodies are always at work. If you're taking cocaine all day, every day, it works less and less. I injected cocaine, and eventually it would get to the point it just didn't work. As bananas as that sounds, it wouldn't matter how much I used. It was time to just let the shit wear off and go to sleep. That's because my body was saying, look, man, whatever this stuff is, we got to figure out what we can put in our bloodstream to push back. So you get away from the guy that stabbed you. And now if your body stays there, just like it would if you had cocaine in your system, I did it. And there's blood leaking out and you just die. So you need that to go away. You need your body to say, okay, 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 we got away. There's way too much adrenaline in our system. Counteract that. Oh, oh, I can feel the pain now. And you go seek treatment. And all of these things are vital to staying alive. You've got to be able to get away from the lion, even if it bites you. But then you've got to at least take care of the injury or you're going to die. And all those things are playing out as our bodies read these chemicals that are like, whoa, we better balance that out. So we have things in our bodies that we seldom talk about called anti-opioids. They are effectively the opposite of opioids. And they float around our bloodstream and they counteract the effects of endorphins and encaphalins, which are the chemicals that our body uses to attach to where codeine attaches or heroin attaches when it's in our body. So when we take heroin and we just extend the amount of opioids in our bloodstream from the the five that are sort of floating around to like 50 billion because it's heroin, our body is like, crap, there's two things we need to do. Number one, and this is the one most of us know about, we got to stop making our own endorphins. Look at all these endorphins floating around. And we've, at least me and most people I talk to, think that detox is when you stop using the heroin or the codeine or the, the Oxycontin or whatever, and your body doesn't have its own endorphins. So it takes a while for it to start making them. That's not what's going on. Your body is much more clever than that. It's also cranking up the anti-opioids, the chemicals whose job it is to mop up the opioids in your bloodstream because your brain's going... Look, if that lion comes around the corner, that's too much opioids. We have got to clean this up so that he runs from the lion or we're in big trouble here. And it's always trying to counteract that. People that have been injecting heroin for 10, 20, 30 years can take doses that are unfreaking believable. It's because they're not starting from zero. But this means that the detox that people experience when they come off of drugs that are like opioids or benzodiazepines or alcohol are brutal because you're not just trying to get your fire your body to fire back up the natural production but you're trying to get it to stop making its own anti-opioids cocaine's a weird one thousands of times over the course of a minute different neurons and different connections are firing different chemicals when they fire i put a neuron in front of you that space is where the, the message goes from one to the other Some use serotonin, some use dopamine, some use various other chemicals to fire across this bridge. And then the chemicals all get mopped up by these other chemicals that we call monoamine transporters. They're like these things that come through and just mop up the ones that get released and they take them back up to the original synapse so they can be put back in there. So the next time a message comes down, they actually get reused. Cocaine just disrupts the cleanup. It works in between the cell to or the the synapse the two neuron spots to just let whatever chemicals come out pack that area which is why it's you know escalates and you end up feeling like everything is firing on all cylinders so whatever used to make you pumped it now just like makes you pumped and you stay pumped and whatever felt good it feels good and now you just stay feeling good and the thing that made you feel like i feel content You just stay feeling content so i like to think of it like a sustain pedal on a piano our bodies are supposed to be up, down, up, up, down, down, like a audio reading. And what cocaine does is just turn off the return to baseline. Uh, the problem, the opponent process. When your body says, uh-oh, 
too much serotonin, norepinephrine, adrenaline, dopamine, all that stuff. We've got to get this stuff out of the synapse. That means the next day when you wake up, while you're not physically dependent, you can't get there because all those chemicals are what you need to go, oh, I'm going to read that book. I'm excited. And instead, you're like, why isn't it working? <laughs> My coffee isn't working right. So that opponent process, that pesky opponent process is always there working with magic. Psychedelics, this is a famous picture that is in, oh, I'm totally spacing on his name. Cha How to Change Your Mind is the name of the book. Michael Pollan. And this is the summary of neuroimaging done on people who are under the influence of LSD and psilocybin. This one's psilocybin. And the dots on the outer edges are supposed to represent specific regions of the brain and neural connections. And your average person, most of us get this, we use all of our brains, so it's hard to even say what I'm getting at here. We use the same pathways over and over again. You know in the middle of the night how to get to your bathroom. Probably leave the lights off because you've done it so many times that it's just natural. So you don't wake up in the middle of the night and evaluate all the options on how to get in the bathroom, double check the floor, turn the light on. You just go take a, a pee and go back to bed. Go to a hotel and suddenly everything changes and you've really got to think about things. This is what our lives are. You turn on your computer and every day, if you use the same computer, the zoom button's in the same spot, the camera's in the same spot, you know how to turn the microphone on and off with shortcuts. Those are all neural pathways. The reason we work so well as humans is we just learn what works for us. When somebody says heroin, most of us have a, a pretty set destination where that thought goes to danger, addiction, going to be homeless, you know, all the stuff that's tied up with that. When you take a psychedelic, LSD, psilocybin, all of the pathways that are steady go everywhere. And this is why people that are tripping make all these bizarre connections where you're like, I never thought about it that way. Because literally, you're making connections in your brain that aren't there. Caffeine, we have a chemical that from the second you wake up in the morning starts building up in your body, adenosine, and it has receptor sites in your brain. So the more that's there, the more you like, you feel tired. It's how circadian rhythm works. Coffee blocks those chemicals, which is why you can drink it and suddenly like your tired kind of goes away. But just like all other things, that pesky opponent process shows up. And it'll only work for so long. So you can't just drink coffee indefinitely. Coffee's got a strong, a long half-life. It's a, I think, oh, it's at the bottom, five hours. So anybody that drinks it at noon even, you've still got quite a bit of caffeine in your system. So you're not sleeping fully when you go to bed. All right. So instead of going any further, questions about where we're at, what we've talked about, or any of these specific drugs. What does MDMA stand for? My daughter is 20, she just turned 24. We had always said, like, oh, I guess we should be good parents and practice what we preach. So if you ever want to do any drugs, just come talk to us and we won't judge you. And so she did. She's like, I want to do Molly. And we were like, oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> so we said, go figure out what it is. Come talk to us about it. And when she went upstairs to study it on the computer, her mom and I were like, oh, crap. What happens if she says yes? Because as parents, what are you going to do? Be like, okay, 16-year-old, have fun. Go and find Molly on the street. I guess go buy it from... We were going to have to get her Molly. So we were downstairs like, oh, crap. Well, who are we going to call? Because you know she's going to say yes. And she went upstairs and came back like 15 minutes later and was like, I think I've read enough. I'm going to wait till I'm 21. And we said, what'd you read? And she said the name, which is methylene deoxy methamphetamine. That last part, methamphetamine. And, and that took her down the rabbit hole of like, wait, is it that kind of methamphetamine? Yeah, it's that kind of methamphetamine. Drugs have weird cultural baggage that unless you look closely, you don't notice. PCP, the scary drug from the 90s that gives people superhuman strength and they lose their mind. The only difference between PCP and ketamine, special K is what the kids call it, is the half-life. Somebody re-engineered PCP and the half-life was too long and it had these disastrous long-term effects because you're tripping too long. And they made it wear off in like 30 minutes instead of in hours. And that was the thing the drug needed. There's a long list of drugs on the top here that are all derived either from the poppy plant that you can actually grow in your backyard. All of these drugs at the top, though, are derived from that plant or are and synthesized from artificial means to mimic those results. So the biggest difference between, say, fentanyl and heroin is something called half-life. And I think that's a good spot to uh, wrap up and turn it over to, to questions. Methadone clinics, Suboxone clinics should ring a bell to all of us nowadays, but they're sort of hidden and most of us wouldn't know where they are unless we've been there. 
What I heard growing up when I actually, I never heard about methadone until I ended up on it. I used it for five or six years when I stopped injecting heroin is that why would you trade one drug for another? Why do you want to go from one addiction to another? Fentanyl has a half-life of 18 minutes, minutes. That means when you get as high as you can possibly get on fentanyl, 18 minutes later, half of it is gone. And 18 minutes after that, half of what was left is gone. And about an hour later, you're like, crap, I'm detoxing. Heroin's a little bit better. It's about 35 to 45 minutes, half of it's gone. So this means if I'm dog sick, because I haven't had my dope today, and I finally get a dose, ah, and right here on the back of my mind, already sneaking to the front is, don't ah too much, dude. You got to get out there and do work, because right behind you is the monster detox coming for you. Go get some heroin so that you're not sick when it shows up, because you're not going to be able to do anything when you're sick. Addicted people spend our lives often in these repetitive loops of use that are based on the short half-life. Methadone has a half-life of 20 to 30 hours. So we go get it in an oral dose. We take it at 7 a.m. It kicks in really slow. We never get dope sick. And most of us at about 8 a.m. go, what am I going to do with the rest of the day now? And we go get jobs. We start paying income tax. We get degrees like I did. We write books. We raise kids. We get back to living because we're not caught all day long in this repetitive loop. There is a big dump truck full of drugs and war on drugs facts that I offer to all of you. All right, now I open it to questions. The problem is twofold. So number one, most people don't know what those are. They just know cocaine. That's that thing I've watched Scarface snort for 20 years. And then you figure it out through experience and your friend offers you something. There's no one at the front side to say, before you do this drug, let's talk about what it is and how you're going to feel in four hours and what to do if at midnight tonight, you're like, oh shit, I can't go to sleep. And I feel like I want to use more and I'm out. What do I do? Let's get all that out of the way on the front side. But the other part of it is like to talk to people about what drugs they should use for a good night out. I think most of our issues like binge drinking on college campuses, I get there's this like weird toxic masculine idea of oh, we got to drink till we're unconscious and that'll be fun. And that's part of it. But I think more than that, it's like the choice of drugs. I mean, they go into the, the drug store of the United States and they look around and they're like seven trillion kinds of alcohol tobacco, that's it. And maybe some bath salts behind the counter. There's not a lot to choose from. I don't think that'll go away until we just start having real conversations about it. And more importantly, making sure people know where to get it. It's really hard to test cocaine because it'll show positive, but you don't know if it's 15% or 60%. How do we begin to destigmatize how we view addicted people users? So I have a, the book was called Dr. Junkie, not because I'm just an asshole who uses the term junkie haphazardly, but rather because I've had two terms. And I think I gave you the intro where I just described this. So forgive me if I'm repeating myself. In my life, I'm a PhD. That term, like they hired me to teach college classes and I got to write a book. What up with that, right? <laughs> Never saw it coming. Open some doors. What a powerful piece of language, doctor. Junkie? Oh, that one did some work on me too, right? It was the, the most powerful label that was ever applied to me. And in my experience, I know in the United States, we're taught, take credit for everything you do and be proud. I don't see my, my rise through from addiction to where I'm at now. I mean, I don't see it as I buckled down and I did. It was pure luck in a way that is replicable because I'm not, I can't take credit. I'm not different than anybody else. I stumbled into a healthy environment, some support groups. And the goal would be to like share all that with people and say, you got to define your own recovery. You've got to decide. For me, it was like, I am not going to stop using drugs. And people keep telling me that if I'm using drugs, I'm not in recovery. So how about screw them? I'll just define recovery for myself. And it has to be sustainable. You know, I had people around me that if I was like, recovery looks like smoking crack only five days a week, they would have been like, no, <laughs> right? It's got to be a sustainable model, but for lots of us, recovery does not look like clean and sober. So I think getting rid of stigma has a lot to do with working on the nuts and bolts like we're doing in here, but also the images of what addiction looks like. Most of us, when you say addict, addicted person, we got a pretty clear mental image of what pops in. Homeless, missing teeth, bad skin, can't get a job, twitchy, you know, all this stuff that you're like, yeah, we watch a lot of TV in this country. Do you think it'd be better to get completely get rid of scheduling drugs or to rework and rethink what drugs should be scheduled? We didn't talk about this a lot today, but the war on drugs only began because those mail order syringes that I mentioned early in the discussion, 
could be mailed to black folks. In the early 1900s, post-Civil War, we can all understand why there was a lot of people who loved their dope, their morphine, their heroin, their uh, cocaine. They had terrible amputations that were done on the battlefield and bones sticking out and these awful conditions that they then had to go home and live with. Luckily, they had drugs. They could just go to the store and get them. And Timmy was not like, Grandpa's using cocaine again. I don't want to be around him. Nobody gave a crap if the veterans used their drugs to feel good about life. But those veterans had to walk into the store that had a sign on the window that said, whites only. And there was like de facto segregation on who was allowed to use drugs. The early drug laws are worded in weird ways that if you look close, the marijuana spelled with an H tax act is the first anti-marijuana law on the federal books. And it was aimed at Mexican immigrants who were smoking. They brought with them this cultural practice of smoking marijuana. And in the United States, we could buy cannabis tincture. It was great for menstrual cramps, headaches, having a bad day, as all of us know. We just didn't realize they're going to stop selling that stuff in your cabinet. We didn't make the connection those that were like in the mainstream because what was being deployed was the weaponization of our racial resentments. With opium, it was Asian immigrants on the West Coast who had come for the San Francisco gold rush, and then it dried up. And they moved to Reno farther inland for the silver rush, and it dried up in the 1890 or so. Uh Uh-oh, what do we do with all this cheap labor that we loved last week, and now we're going to have to support them because we can't pay them to get silver for Let's stigmatize them and get them out of here. They're smoking opium. Everybody was like, well, what about our morphine? I want my heroin syringe. And like, yes, we're 100 years now into this so far that most of us don't. How could we remember that history? We weren't here when these laws were exclusively written to prevent black folks from using the same drugs white folks. In our world, we were all taught they're illegal because they're deadly. So we meet somebody like me and you're like, you use drugs. What the hell? That's the, the stigma the last question was addressing. I don't know. I think it takes slow, steady work of talking through it. Uh, How would you recommend people who have addictive personalities and a family history of addiction navigate social spaces where drugs are present? Should they stay away from these substances completely? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm lucky that I'm at a place in my, what I call recovery, where uh, like I think about injecting cocaine and I'm like, "Mm, I'm just not interested. Again, by no, I haven't like done the work to get there. It's just I've come to think of those substances in a different way. If you're not in that place with a substance though, yeah, I I think right now, as much as we need to move towards a group mentality and caring about one another and thinking more about, you got to take care of all of us if you want to take care of one, you've also got to right now take care of yourself. If you're somebody that struggled with addiction and you're like, oh, they're drinking tonight, it sucks. But alcohol is so, I love alcohol, but If I didn't and I quit drinking, like it would be awful to live in a culture where every freaking where you go, there is a bar. It's the one drug that you're like, oh, we're having a conference for PhDs in communication. Better have an alcohol bar every five feet. That's got to be difficult if you're somebody that's struggled with, with alcoholism. So I wish I had the answer to that one. I think that part of our job as drug users and as activists who are out here talking about this stuff is to go the extra mile and be sensitive to those people. And, you know, as much as I like, I come across as flaunting my drug use and I find myself frequently trying to be sensitive around people that I know. I'm not trying to trigger somebody in my class to go out and get high or whatever. Oregon. Oh boy. So Oregon decriminalized all drugs a year and a half ago. My good friend Morgan Godvin, who spent years in federal prison for murder because she gave her friend who was detoxing a gram of heroin and he overdosed and died. She works on the Oregon Commission to put all these laws into effect. And she came on my podcast two or three months ago. It's called The Dr. Junkie Show. It's wherever you stream if you want to check it out. But she, she did a really good job catching us up on how things have started to get better. But the police have been a little bit pissed off about this. And so instead of doing what they were supposed to do, which is keep interacting with people. And when they have drugs, you write them a ticket to go talk to a group of people who aren't cops, but are treatment professionals and can maybe offer them some treatment. They just ignored it. They were like, well, fine. If you guys want to legalize drugs, screw it. So it hasn't worked quite the way they said, but we are in the middle of a cultural shit storm. That is the reason that overdoses are through the roof. Drugs work really well to numb pain. And those of us that had family connections that have gone away, and we used to have a hard day and call our sister who now hates us because we voted for the wrong person or whatever, right? 
that always results in a culture turning to substances, and we've never educated ourselves about those substances. So Oregon's also dealing with this massive homeless crisis, the economic collapse that's gone hand in hand with the rich getting super rich from Bitcoin and everything means that those that don't have it are now, it's even harder to get a house because housing costs are up. Those things have all played together. And uh, my concern is that we're going to end up having Oregon look like it's, it failed based on everything else that's going on. The big problem with this and with Portugal for that matter, you can't buy drugs anywhere. The reason for that is that the police have done the math long ago. When the police pull you over and you've got an eight ball of cocaine in your pocket, in the United States, in any city and state in the country, they can not only take your cocaine and your car and, and any cash you have, but they can take you to jail. And if the next day or the next week the prosecutor's like, I'm going to drop the charges, they don't have to give any of it back. They can call it all proceeds of drugs and they sell it at the next auction next month unless you can hurry up and file, pay an attorney. Get in there and challenge it because the property is charged with the crime, not you. It's charged with being proceeds of drug sales. These are how police departments have been making massive amounts of funding for years. They break in one house with 10 kilos and 100 grand, and they can hire two more cops next year or buy a couple of cop cars. They've done the math, not to mention all the cops that are going to get fired because we don't need you to make drug arrests anymore. And there's just not enough murders and violence to go around. That's a terrible thought for departments to think like, well, I'd have to fire a bunch of my cops. So we played this back and forth where we're just like, well, then we'll only arrest the dealers. Until we rethink that, we're not going to see a whole lot of progress. So I think that's our next big step is, is talking to people about why we should legalize drugs. The ironic thing about this is the biggest reason for the super conservatives in your life is if you really want people to stop using drugs, that's how you do it. Sounds bananas, but when you go to these countries where, where drug users can get a safe supply, we stop using, we reduce our use, we switch from injecting to taking it orally, we go from heroin to methadone to nothing at all sometimes. I don't think decriminalization is going to happen that soon. I think we're going to see something very similar to it, and I'm Trump could have won if he would have made his campaign platform redoing drug laws. And I think at least with marijuana, that's how much we've moved as a culture. John Boehner, who was like the head of the Republican Party for 15 years and was so anti-marijuana, repeatedly said, there's nothing on earth you can show me that would make me change my mind. Now he's retired from the Senate and guess who owns marijuana distribution company in the United States? John Boehner, a conservative. That's a big move. And I think that that's sort of paved the way for if somebody wants to make it their campaign platform, I'll, I'll run commercials for you on my podcast. Give me a call. I think we'll see something very similar to it. It's going to look more like drug clinics. And you know, like I started with, these are places where instead of going to your skeezy drug dealer who tries to sell you every drug under the sun and you find fingernails in it sometimes, if you go to a place that has therapists, clinics, doctors, pharmacists, group treatment centers throughout the day that they invite you with, and you encounter people that give a shit at every step of the way. And ultimately, if you decide you want the drugs, peace be with you, take your drugs. But the goal would be to get people surrounded by people that give a crap. If we didn't decriminalize drugs, the opioid crisis would be gone is, is not fair because pain is always going to be medicated and fentanyl is, it, that wine analogy I used is not an exaggeration. I used that in the book to say, imagine you did, you, your coffee is 110 times stronger than it is. Three sips put you in the hospital, whereas three sips of wine, and usually you're like, I still don't really feel it. It is that much of a difference. Fentanyl would presumably be one of the drugs people could get. And if people are using it, we'd have to figure out a way. I don't know if we make vape pens or it's a dosing issue. It's really hard to dose a drug that's as strong as fentanyl. Like the tip of this pen is enough to overdose two or three people if they don't have tolerance. By the way, if you ever hear anybody say he touched fentanyl and overdosed, correct them. That's not a thing. And it's been debunked so many times that I can't believe these stories still show up where a cop is uh, unconscious and the story in the paper is like oh he was looking through a suspect's thing and he touched fentanyl that's not a thing it's not possible the only way that could happen is if somebody exploded the bag and like blew it all up their nose all these stories that have come out later are debunked and those stories don't make as much noise as the original so anytime you see that story watch for a week later when they run the detraction the reason this is a problem is that if you see somebody who looks like they've overdosed on fentanyl and you think touching it might let you overdose, you're not going to go help that person. We've sort of built the system to cause these problems. I appreciate y'all sticking with me. That's it. 
If you want more information about these topics, consider picking up the book, Dr. Junkie, One Man's Story of Addiction and Crime That Will Challenge Everything You Know About the War on Drugs. And if you want to have me come lecture as a guest at your school, share this episode with your teachers or with the administrators who are in charge of that and have them contact me. Maybe your class will be next. Love yourselves and the addicted people in your life. I'm Ben Boyce.